So I would call this group a family, and we'll, we'll call them the Duns. Uh, the Duns are not a new family. They've been around for centuries. And the Duns are not a distant family. Uh, the Duns are kin to all of us. They aren't necessarily a bad family either. And they've just decided for one reason, reason or another that they're done. It's done. No moss. So three things very quickly. Number one, who are the Duns? Well, like I said, these aren't necessarily bad people. These are people who aren't necessarily backslidden or apostate, but they're, they're done with what we oftentimes refer to as formal church. Now, <clears throat> the reason I'm bringing this to you is twofold. Number one, we're in between Acts 4 and 5, and so we, we typically do something that's not expositional there. And secondly, that this... Uh, this family has re- resurged in the last few years, and it's, it's kind of a thing now where th- there are groups of people referred to as the Duns because of what we're going to talk about this morning. And, and, and again, they're, they're, they haven't walked away from Christ. They haven't said, I'm not a believer anymore. What they have done is, it's decided for one reason or another, maybe several reasons, that they don't necessarily need the formal church. And that's kind of what we're going to focus on this morning. And I just want to encourage you to ask the Lord to move in your heart and see if you are a done, if you've ever been a done, or if you feel the temptation to become a done. Their reasoning is varied. Some of the more popular reasons are, especially now, I can get better preaching at home. There's, there's better preachers. There's not necessarily better pastors because by definition, a pastor has to have some relationship with the sheep. But maybe the sermons are better. I mean, we've all heard somebody say, oh, yeah, I just, I, I really like to worship from the house and I can watch You know, fill in the blank. Joel Osteen, John MacArthur, you know, Alistair Begg, Al Mohler, you know, Chuck Swindoll, you know, right? We've heard it. And and, and so that's what they do. And and they justify it because, hey, they're better preachers than my pastor is anyway, right? And um, there's other factors that we'll talk about that come into play here. Um. One of those factors is I can worship more conveniently. I just throw on my PJs, put on a pot of coffee, throw the ottoman out there in front of my lounge chair, and, and relax. I mean, hey, pastor, isn't that what we're supposed to do on the Lord's Day anyway? Relax? Well, I'm just relaxing, man. I'm chillaxing. You young people, I know that's an old word. I got it. I am old. But, but if, that's, if that's your mentality or that's their mentality, one of the things I want to ask you or them is, can you honestly say that the Spirit of God is specially there when you do that? Now, I understand that if you're a converted person, you always have the Holy Spirit. So we don't need to invite him in. He's here, Right? But there is a specialness about the corporate gathering where we, we affirm one another or other things that I'll talk about in a second. There's a special spirit of unity and community when we are here together. And I'm just going to be honest with you, you don't have that at home by yourself. I can drink my own grape juice and eat my own cracker. In fact, who says communion has got to be corporate anyway? Well, let me help you out with that. The Bible doesn't say it that explicitly, but the Bible never gives any other example of taking the Lord's Supper than corporately. In fact, 
the, 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 the communication around taking the Lord's Supper is due to corporate issues. Despise not the church of God by taking the Lord's Supper unworthily. If you ever read 1 Corinthians, Paul says, do you despise the church of God? When he asked that question, because some people were eating all the food or getting drunk before everybody else got there. So literally, it's a rhetorical question, they were despising everyone else because it's a corporate activity. That's why we, I don't go to people's houses and give them Lord's Supper. Even if you're on your dying deathbed, I'm not going to do it because that's not the purpose of it. They say, I don't have to go to a building to worship God. And those of us who hunt know, we've heard people say, I can do it from my deer stand. I can do it from the house, etc. And, and in a sense, that is true. But again, the Bible teaches us over and over and over, explicitly and implicitly, that worship is corporate. As a matter of fact, it's corporate by definition. The word church means called out ones. So we are called out from the world. We're no longer unconverted people. But we're called out from the community to come together as a people. So when you look in your Bible and it says, you know, the header to Ephesians is to the church at, to the called out ones at Ephesus. Well, Ephesus had its body of called out ones. We come together collectively by definition as church. If you stay home because of better preaching, better grape juice, or whatever, ask yourself these questions. And you should be able to answer some of these because we just came through COVID. You can, you can probably very honestly answer some of these questions. Number one, did you sing? When you were at home watching me standing out there on Facebook Live, were you singing? Did you sing? Because remember, if you don't remember, I encouraged you to try to treat Sunday mornings as normal as possible when we started doing this videotaping. Do you know why I did that? Because I knew your propensity would be not to. It's kind of goofy, right, to stand up in your living room and sing Amazing Grace. And your husband's saying, will you keep it down? I'm trying to get my coffee. Are you robustly really singing to the Lord, anticipating the preaching of God's Word? You can answer that. And I, I could lose some of the bets if I was a betting man. But if I were and made those bets, I'd probably win most of those bets. You didn't do it. Secondly, were you attendant at the preaching? Were, were, were you focused on whoever you were watching's face, their message, taking notes, letting the Holy Spirit move in you? Or were you distracted because the dog came up and licked you? Or somebody went to the bathroom? One of the kids is upset about something. That's what happened, mostly. Now, I know these things because pastors talk to each other and we, 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 we find out these things from each other. Were you engaged? Let me be honest with you. This church is one of the most engaging churches I've ever seen. Like every time I preach, it's, I never see people looking away. You, you guys are always like looking at me. And that's good. I mean, I hope that means you're engaged. Because everybody's not that way. But, but were you that way with the TV? If you were, you probably had to discipline yourself to it because that's hard to do. Focus. Stay engaged to the TV set. Did you endure? Did you watch the whole sermon? 
Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you what the answer to that is for most people. It's a big fat no. And you say, well, how do you don't, you don't know all that? Uh, Facebook analytics. I can look on there and I can see how many people watched for more than three seconds. And most people don't. I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at me. I, I'm the same way you are. I, have a, I can't stay home and go to church either. I'm, I'm, just, I'm trying to prove to you something we just came out of testifies clearly that that is not normal for us in a worship service. We are supposed to have this with the singing and the praying and the giving the corporate worship together. And we can probably contrast that with just a year or so ago. The Duns have indicated that church is not really that important. The Duns have indicated that church is more about them than about others of the Lord and yet that's not true everybody that's ever been in one of my D groups will tell you that I tell them you are not here for you you are coming to this D group for me so when you feel like you just want to stay home tonight for no good reason and there are good reasons to be out I'm not getting at that but you just kind of ah, you know it's not that big a deal well, it is to me. You're, you're literally, to put it in New Testament terms, despising me when you don't come out for a no good reason. And the same thing is for the local assembly. It is not to be despised. And I'll give you some good, valuable reasons for that later. Who the Duns are is a reflection of their ecclesiology. That's their doctrine of the church so seeing who they are let's ask why are they done the duns are done because something caused them to adopt this philosophy and i just want to give you three things real quick number one that may be that they were hurt by the church well i've been doing this for decades for three decades okay let me just tell you the reality you can either believe me or learn it okay the church is going to hurt you i mean it just is somebody is going to say or do something that you don't like or purchase something that you're not in favor of or not say it the way you wanted to hear it or whatever and and that's going to be just enough at the right time to stop the race I'm done. I, as a pastor, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen it. I mean, let me, let me just, I'm going to be completely transparent with you, okay? This can get me in trouble, I know, but I'm just going to do it. Three and a half years ago, I was standing right over there. I think I was right over there. Might have been here. And we, we were having these, you know, question and answer Saturdays. We did two of them. And, and people, you know, the church people could come in and ask me questions as I was in the candidate process. And one of those Saturdays, and some of you may remember me saying this, I said, you know, you, you may like me up front, but I promise you, in, in the years to come, you're not going to like me as much as you did on the front end. Not because I'm a bad guy. I'm worse than you think, but you know what I mean. But, but we, we are all not perfect people. Let me illustrate this for you. How many times did you have a friend that you were really close to on the front end of your relationship, but after a little while into it, you realize this is one of the people that you like least in life? Life was full of that kind of stuff. And oftentimes the people that you don't like are the ones you end up loving to death on the, on the back end. Young people, you're going to learn that. We older people have learned it. 
You know how it works? The first year or two, the pastor is the best thing since sliced bread. The third through the fifth year, he's the devil's cousin. About the fifth through the seventh year, he becomes the pastor. That's how it works. So, I'm going to hurt you. I'm, I'm not all that in a bag of chips. Neither are you. This, that's the way it goes. You are worshiping, hanging out with, co-partnering with a bunch of sinners. You need to know that and to hold on to that. Secondly, maybe some have an errant ecclesiology. They have never been taught some of the things that I've taught you today about ecclesiology. And that we're still going to learn. We're a body. We're a unit. This is the Lord's people. This isn't a government agency. This isn't the Lions Club I'll give you an example, and this, this message is not about membership. Don't misunderstand me. But, for example, in membership, we covenant together. Like, when you say, I want to be a member of Hunter's Creek, you are, you are entering into a covenant relationship with me and us. You are shaking my hand and saying, I agree to do and be with and to you the things that this covenant says. It's covenanting together. That's why we, one of the reasons why we have some accountability and responsibility to one another. Because you said you wanted it. Now, when was the last time the pastor told you about covenant relationship? We don't talk about it. But it's in that little green book that you read when you said you wanted to be a member. It's what we do. Let's go back to Acts 4. Didn't these people all covenant together to sell their houses or lands to help the other people out? That's why Ananias and Sapphira, which, which we're going to see in chapter 5, Peter laid them out to the death. They lied to God. They didn't keep their commitment. And thirdly, Maybe something took them off track. An illness can do that. You, you get sick, you're out for a while, it's, it's hard to get back in. COVID. COVID created a lot of duns because they realized they can stay home. And you know some of these people. They told you about it. Man, I didn't realize how good staying at home is. Same thing happened at your workplace, right? See that picture? That picture's up there for a reason. I knew one day I'd need this picture. That's about two and a half years old. And what it was, I was at some friend's house, and we were having a, a book read together. And, you know, like a fire, you kind of keep adding wood to it. Well, I saw this one piece of wood just flop. You know, it fell off the log, and as, as the fire got smaller, that lump got farther away from the heat. Now, it's black. It's been burning. There's gray on that thing because it's been burning. But where's that thing at? It's not in the pile. It's in my hand. My soft, supple hand because it's not hot you know why it's not hot it got out of the fire when you get out of the fire folks that's a powerful impression when you get out of the fire you don't have the heat and the comfort the compatibility of of, of the group you'll get cold Every one of us knows some Christian who justified getting out away from God, becoming a dun, and then they stopped reading their Bible, they stopped praying, they stopped sharing the gospel, so forth and so on. 
regardless of the reasons, an errant theology due to being broken in a sin-filled world has distracted the Duns from God's divine plan. Does it matter? Yes, it matters. What are the effects, thirdly, of the Duns? We'll consider it on two fronts. Number one, on themselves. First and foremost, they have disobeyed Scripture. Hebrews 10.25, as our text is, says don't do it. Conversely, stir one another up. Encourage one another. And I think many of us would say that we see the last days coming. At least it looks that way, right? So much the more as you see the day appearing, right? But here we've been reading in Acts chapter 4, 1, 2, 3, and 4. We're getting ready to go into Acts chapter 5. And we see, this, we see this group of people that are coming out. And Peter's just constantly quoting the Old Testament to them, Old Testament. And he's preaching the gospel. And people are getting saved. And they're coming together or the, the synagogue or in uh, Solomon's porch. Later on, they'll go into people's houses. They're, they're doing this. They're coming together. That's what Scripture presents to us. Secondly, they've alienated themselves from the benefits of the local church. As mentioned before, taking Lord's Supper with one another and with the responsibility and accountability that are involved there. With the corporate worship that includes the singing, as we talked about earlier. What about the giving? So, oh, I, you know, I give down at the, you know, whatever. Do you know where that money goes? Once you hand them a check, do you ever follow up with anybody, the Lions Club or the Goodwill store or whatever, and say, hey, what y'all do with that money? You know, you can do that with us. We have, we, we have business meetings quarterly, and you can see where the money's spent. You can come to me or the treasurer or the financial committee any time and ask us what we're spending money on. It's not your money, because once you give it, it's God's money. But having given it, we are responsible to steward it for you and to God, which gives you the right, as part of this body, to inquire. Try that at the Goodwill store, or whatever else that we may tend to give to. Prayer. We, we pray corporately here, and I, I, I hope that everybody who prays here corporately is doing so not, not to you, but to God with you being able to hear it. Does that make sense? And if not, let that be an encouragement to those of us who pray publicly here to pray to God. Not form, formally or whatever, but honestly. Th there is great benefit in hearing the prayer of people. What about accountability? D is, there, is there anybody at the house that's keeping you straight? That's admonishing you or encouraging you? Discipline, what happens if you get out of line? Is there somebody going to come along to the side and say, hey, brother, you can't do that. One person and two and three people and whatever the case might be, Matthew 18. Congregational care to and from others. When we have needs, we are able to give to one another, support one another. Uh, whenever we have needs ourselves, the, the body can give to us and to help us and encourage us. That's congregational care. Now listen, I, 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 I think the Bible is very clear on, on church relationships. You are not on your own here. You don't have the right as part of this body to be an independent rebel. Because you have a certain amount of accountability to everybody else here. Because you're a body. You're need, needy of one another. Useful to one another. And do you use ministry at home? 
Are, are you ministering to anybody? Most people aren't. And that brings us to others. When others see you worshiping at home, what do they think about the local church? Well, why are the other 226 people going to that building? Why don't they just do like you and stay home? I don't know. If they knew how good it was. There was a church in upstate South Carolina. It was one of these big mega churches back. In, they, they still are. There's a bunch of them. Kind of like Kensington here, but much bigger. I'm not picking on anybody. Um, but years ago, they had um, they changed their evening service. And the reason they changed their evening service was for the Super Bowl. Now, I had some friends that were going to this church. And I remember saying to them, I said, why, why did you change your service, your evening service, for the Super Bowl? And they said, well, we moved it to Saturday so that people could watch the Super Bowl on Sunday. And I told them, I said, you know, I really don't care if you have a Sunday night service or not. I can only defend one service on the Lord's Day. And I can defend it to the death, but I can only defend one. I said, but if you're going to have it, have it. Because when you say to the world, we are willing to move worship of God for a game, you've let them win. You just told them that that's more important than your worship of the Creator. You may not have meant to say that, but that's what you did. So don't have a Sunday night if you don't want to, but if you're going to have it, have it. And, you know, you can always record the football game and watch it later without the halftime show. Am I starting to preach a little bit? <laughs> Sorry about that. It's just a personal example, you know. Do you understand what I'm saying? What, what does it say to your spouse and your children? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a rainy, cold day. And I just stay home today. Uh. Everybody put your PJs on, Pastor Gooding will be on Facebook, you know. Every time somebody says something, I'm just being honest with you. Every time somebody says something like them, that to me, and they do, I think about the Ghanaians who went and worked in their peanut farm on Sunday morning, and then they walked several miles in who knows what kind of weather to go to the worship service. And I've preached to them. I've seen them sitting out on the, on the pews or in their chairs like this for an hour. And they're not sleeping. They're resting. But they're in the worship service because they've been working. And they're tired. But they saw the benefit of coming to the Lord's house on the Lord's day with the Lord's people. It's important to them. Now, don't do it just to check off the box. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about religiosity. I'm not even talking about just mere faithfulness. I'm talking about desire to be with God's people in God's house because it's important to you. And you benefit from it. Even if you don't see the benefit every day. My wife has cooked thousands of meals for me. I can't tell you about every single one of them. But I'm not starving to death. Has being exposed to your understanding of corporate worship affected those people so that they would say to you that church is all about you? Or think about the worship, the church itself, as some kind of a la carte industry. I, I, I'll take what I want. I, you know, I go to Sunday school, but I get my preaching somewhere else. Thirdly, church, to be fair about all this, has not always done everything perfectly well and right. Let, let me illustrate or tell you what I'm talking about. You know, um, personally, I get frustrated with me when I don't know of a need that somebody has or I feel like I'm not pastoring them well personally. That's bothersome to me. 
I also have to kind of balance that out with time and ability and, and whatever. And I'm not one of these people that think I should just go knock on your house because I'm the pastor and you should have, you know, coffee and apple pie there for me. You know, I don't, I'm not invasive that way. If you want me over, say something and I'll come see you, whatever. But, and every pastor will tell you this, we don't do as good a job as we should or as many of us would like to when it comes to pastoring our people very practically. Sometimes it's very difficult to do. Sometimes we're just, we fail at it. And, and quite honestly, sometimes it's discouraging. Sometimes you'll see somebody and they haven't been to church. Maybe you didn't know it, and, but you found out they haven't been in six weeks or whatever. And then you go to see them and they treat you like some kind of dirty dog. And I'll tell you, even the pastor who doesn't see you as much as he would like to is probably more invested in you than you realize because he goes to sleep with you on his mind daily. You probably don't think about me daily, right? But I think about you daily. You probably never have have missed a minute's worth of sleep thinking about Dale Gooding, but I do. I'm, I'm invested in you, right? And it bothers me when I don't do a good job with you. But a lot of churches have that problem. A lot of pastors do. COVID did not help, and it facilitated people feeling justified by staying away. Sometimes we don't know the people as well as we would like. Sometimes we don't know what their needs are uh, as they pop up. Um, Engaging in people's lives um, issue uh, comes from uh, having a, a whole shepherding philosophy. Um, in pastoral response to, uh, responsiveness, um, sometimes we, again, just we don't do very well at it. And a lot of times people will ghost you. You know what ghosting is? You young people probably know what ghosting is. Oh, I don't know all the nuances of ghosting, but a lot of times they'll just fall off the radar, and they don't tell you they're falling off the radar. Like for, for example, if you have a Facebook page and somebody uh, drops your friendship, they probably don't say, hey, Ken, just to let you know, I don't want to be your friend anymore, so I'm dumping you from my Facebook friend list. That probably rarely happens, right? All of a sudden, you just notice they're gone. You don't see them anymore. Ken's, oh man, I hadn't seen Ken in weeks. That's what happens at church. People don't come say, hey pastor, I don't like the fact that you have a bottle of water up there on the pulpit. They just quit coming. Don't do that. Come talk to me. Don't ghost me. Because it helps me help you if you let me know what's going on. Because I care about you. I want to pastor you. I want to be a, a, a better pastor. I want to do a better job. Because we're a body. Because we covenant together. Imagine a spouse who bragged about being somebody else's spouse, but never spent time with them. Or carried all kinds of pictures of their kids in their wallet, but never spent time with their kids. You say, well, that's dysfunctional. That's dysfunctional. So, I hope this picture makes a point to us. If you're a dun, ask yourself, who's going to bury your loved one when they pass away? Who's going to help you when you become needy? Who's going to hold you accountable when you get out of the way? Christianity is not a private faith. We're a body. We're unified. We're committed to one another. And I'll leave you with this. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy in the pastoral epistle of 1 Timothy, If I delay... You may know how one ought to behave himself in the household of God, which is 
the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So here scripture tells us that the church of God is the pillar and the buttress of the truth. That's God's commentary or his definition about who we are. What a great gift from God. Let us be grateful for it and grateful to participate in its mission. If you're a baptismal candidate, you can go ahead and prepare for baptism. We're going to have a, just one baptism this morning. We're going to have two, and Joel's going to lead us in a couple, few stanzas of a song till everybody gets un and redressed. But as we sing this song, and as we wait, I want to encourage you to consider yourself. Are you done? Do you know some duns? Because if you do, and they're connected to us, you too, like the pastors, have some responsibility in challenging them and holding them accountable to our relationship.